I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Kim. Um, and Kim enjoys a lifelong passion for agronomy and space with several interests, including astronomy, outreach, celestial cartography, and most recently, electronically assisted astronomy, which you will talk about in this talk and tomorrow's talk if you go there. Um, since 2000, Kim's been publishing the Evening Sky Map, and I would have loved to have had that when I was up in the northern Flinders a couple of weeks ago. So next time I go, I'll be taking that map, Kim. Um, and this helps tens of thousands of sky watchers worldwide. Um, Kim is an immediate past president of the Astronomical Society of South Australia, and prior to his retirement, was employed for 30 years as a rocket propulsion scientist where he met, led a world-class team of scientists, engineers, and technicians. Who was that with? That was with Defence Science. DSTO? Yes. Terrific, DSTO. Um, and during his presidency of the um, Astronomical Society, Kim successfully kept South Australian's community of hobby um, astronomers connected via the internet. Um, I did note in one of the other um, citations on the internet today when I was researching Kim that he achieved his PhD in 1987 and his PhD topic was numerical studies of flow through prosthetic heart valves. So cardiovascular studies are just quite amazing. So using your mathematical sciences skills. So I'd like to welcome Kim. Thank you very much for coming and give us your talk. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jerry, for that very warm welcome, and thank you to Jan for inviting me here tonight. It's a bit of a surprise to get an email saying hey, from Butterfly Organisation <laughs> saying, "Hey, would you like to talk about astronomy?" I said, "Yeah, okay, <laughs> of course I do." Um, and, and thank you for turning out tonight. I mean, the weather's not the best, um, although we like to go outside at night when it's clear. And I notice tonight's not too bad, actually. Um, all right, so yeah, as, as Jerry said, um, I started off, um, well, actually, I was born and educated in Adelaide and um, spent most of my time here. I spent some time in Canada, posted in Canada, uh, working with rockets there for a while. Uh, with their equivalent defence organisation. But um, I had a strong interest in mathematics from a young age, and that sort of took me through uh, uh, primary school, high school, university. And eventually, when I finished all my studies, I, um, I thought, uh, well, I might want to keep doing this. So um, I decided to keep doing it. And um, suddenly there was an opportunity to do some um, research, and I picked a topic uh, looking at blood flow through artificial heart valves. And I was fascinated how... You can use mathematics to actually understand um, the flow that occurs um, uh, through those devices and also the physiological impact that flow has on the human body, um, including things like endothelial damage to parts of the, the heart, uh, hemolysis, damage of blood cells, etc., and thrombosis. So I did my work there, and when I finished that, I thought, oh, here's a, there's a job in rocket propulsion. Okay, I'll go do that for a while. <laughs> so I ended up staying in that position for, um, except for a, year, a break of one year when I went into electropical systems for a while. I spent 30 years, just over 30 years in that, that position or that job, and I thought it'd be pretty interesting. I never in my life imagined how interesting it would be. <laughs> it had to be one of the best jobs out there. Many years I didn't know what I was getting paid. I just loved going to work. And uh, eventually I thought, well, I've done this for 30 plus years. I'd, I'd led the team there for about 12 years and had about 20 to 30 staff working uh, with me, developing those capabilities. And I can assure you it's a 24 seven job. Um, we were doing everything. Uh, uh, we can't, I'd love to talk about that. <laughs> but um, in, imagine there's day to day stuff around um, uh, even um, counter, countering threats. Uh, to Australia's interests, a lot of uh, forensic work, uh, ensuring uh, things remain safe in the inventory, a lot of uh, research for advanced propulsion um, and uh, supporting acquisition programs. So it was a really full on, uh, full on job, to put it mildly. And after 30 plus years of full on job, I thought that's enough. <laughs> I can get out and go back to something I really enjoyed as well, and that is astronomy. 
which is where all this started. And it was an interest in the night sky that actually got me interested in uh, the whole area of astronomy. Let's see your screen. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is um, the topic of exploring the universe from the suburbs. The talk tomorrow night is completely different. That's, that's about exploring it from your backyard, which is I just, I don't know, for some reason the words came out different. Um, but yeah, I'm giving it the, essentially the same talk tomorrow night uh, to the Astronomy Society uh, because our planned speaker from uh, Victoria wasn't able to attend. So I got roped in and to give a presentation. And it just so happens I was giving this presentation the day before, which qualified me fully for tomorrow night's presentation. All right, so um, I was going to say a little bit about the Astron Society of South Australia. Um, perhaps I'll just say a little bit. I won't go through all those slides. Um, but I'll also talk briefly about the night sky, how you can go about observing the, the night sky, how you can find stuff in the night sky. Uh, and what will I see uh, using a telescope? Does anyone here have a telescope that they use? No? Does anyone have a telescope that they don't use? <laughs> Does anyone here do it? Look up at the night sky and sort of oh, at yeah. least, uh, yeah. All right, cool. Um, all right, so I might, those of you that may have a telescope and may have used a telescope, I might ask you a few questions later. But anyhow. Um, and also, I'll talk a little bit about light pollution, which I think most people understand what light pollution is these days. And image stacking, why is that in the same sense, same bullet point? Because I didn't have enough room for more bullet points. Um, and I'll talk about this thing called electronically assisted astronomy. Um, and then I'll show some EAA images of various celestial objects. Now, this is likely to turn into a bit of a, a talk fest or death by PowerPoint. Hopefully, I, you won't be bored. <laughs> I've got something interesting there through most of this. Got it. It is a remote view. Oh, got a flicker. So it's just that one. That's that's better. I can stand back here. All right, I won't go through that. Okay, so we, as the Astronomy Society of South Australia, it was founded in 1892. It's it's the first society of its kind in Australia. Hopefully you can see all that. Good. We've got about 750 members at the moment, and uh, membership is open to anyone uh, with an interest in astronomy. You don't need to own a telescope or use a telescope. You can join anytime you want. And we support members and promote the science of astronomy in South Australia. And uh, if you want to learn more about membership benefits, you can go to asa.org.au slash join to learn a bit more. Uh, we provide information to our members. I won't read through all of that. It's pretty self-evident. Um, we have monthly meetings. We invite speakers, um, often professional astronomers, to talk about some current topic. But we also invite others who are quite interested in astronomy. Myself to give talks occasionally. Uh, members, and, and we've got one tomorrow night, and that's me. But you may want to look through our past uh, presentations, which are actually on YouTube, some pretty amazing presentations on there. We provide some education to, to members as well. Well, that jumped. And yeah, you can see some of our, um, uh, one of our sessions here. Uh, most of the universe is missing. <laughs> Find out why. You can go watch the, the video online, and or you can watch many of the others. The End of Time is a particularly fascinating uh, presentation. It talks about the future history of the universe, uh, what happens. And um, it can be quite traumatic for some people to listen to what the science says. <laughs> Let's just say we don't know how good we currently have it, right? <laughs> well, that's a fantastic presentation by Professor Geraint Lewis. So that's one that's looked out for. And of course, Are We Alone? That's one you can see on, on there as well. And the, the actual, the hidden story of Apollo 13, uh, Australia's role in that mission, not well known at all. Fascinating presentation by the guys at Arts who were involved. All right, so we have special interest groups and these sort of topics. Uh, we have observatories around the countryside um, and uh, the benefits of joining are listed there, uh, which you'll find if you go to asset.org.au slash join. Okay, next slide. So exploring the universe from the suburbs. Uh, that's tonight's talk. And uh, hopefully keep, people hear me okay at the back. Great, thanks. I'm probably gonna lose my voice at some stage, but. So the purpose of this presentation is really to raise awareness about the universe ar around us, the one we live in and options for exploring it from your backyard. How to find things, uh, objects in the night sky, the benefits of electronic, observing electronically, 
uh, the emergence of these things called smart robotic telescopes for consumers. <laughs> That's us here. And I'll give some image examples as well. So let me ask you a question. What can you see when you look up at the night sky? This is to the audience. What can you see? Stars. Stars. Anything else? Black space. Black space. Milky Way. Milky Way. The moon. Yep. Planets. Sorry, was that planets? Planets. planets? Yep. Yep. Sky Anything planets. else? Aeroplanes. Aeroplanes. <laughs> Astronomical objects. <laughs> You won't see Skylab anymore. Oh, okay. That's the one we International Space Station. Space Station. Yeah. That's the one. All right. So basically, there's a lot of stuff up there, right? There's, there's a lot. And I think one of these slides actually provides a bit of a list. All right. So I think we're all familiar with that, uh, being the Milky Way. And that's a sensational sight to see. Probably the, one, the best time of the year in Australia to see it is uh, around August, July, August from a very dark sky location in the evening, uh, you know, well before midnight, uh, it's basically goes from horizon to horizon directly above. So the Milky Way is our galaxy. That's the galaxy we live in. And most of the stuff you see when you look up in the night sky is part of the Milky Way. There are only a handful of objects that, that will be part of say our, our solar system, which is still part of the Milky Way, but there's a, there's very, there's only about two, uh, two or three other objects you can see that are beyond our Milky Way. All right, so all the action for the most part happens here. That's not to say you can't explore the rest of the, the stuff, the extra galactic stuff, the stuff beyond our universe, um, beyond our Milky Way, sorry, um, from your backyard. The moon is a stunning sight through a telescope. If anyone's ever seen, look through a telescope, you look at the moon, it's just breathtaking. In fact, I think it's probably the most impressive sight. Saturn is just as impressive, if not more so. A lot of people don't believe the views when they look through a telescope, even like this one, and they see a planet with rings around it. They think we've magically put a slide in there, and yeah, we're, we're trying to trick them somehow. Uh, but the views of Saturn are really quite awe-inspiring, and uh, a lot of people just uh, remember that for the, the rest of their lives when they see that. Okay, and there are other objects like these things called globular star clusters that, which are just over a hundred that surround our Milky Way galaxy. And they're thought to be, um, they believe that they are, some of them at least are uh, galaxies that collided or interacted with our galaxy, the Milky Way, and we're stripped of most of their stars and this is all that's left of them. And with then some of these also non contain black holes in, in, uh, or clusters of black holes in their centers. And that's been observed indirectly, which is pretty amazing. All right, so they are some of the brightest objects in the night sky that I just put up there. You've got Saturn and the planet, the bright planets like Jupiter, the Moon, uh, Milky Way. You can't miss with your uh, just with your eyes. But there's a whole universe out there that's beyond this. So the night sky, uh, which I'll talk to now, professional astronomers typically study space at different scales. They might look at the solar system, and that extends out to two light years, which is about half, which is about half the distance to the our next nearest star to the sun. Um, and in that, in that solar system, you've got, you've got planets, the sun, dwarf planets, uh, lots of moons, including our own, comets, asteroids, and meteoroids. The Milky Way, which is our galaxy, um, extends out to tens to 100,000 light years, roughly. It spans a diameter of about 120,000 light years. And if you don't know what a light year is, it's the the distance light travels in one year, moving at 300,000 kilometers per second. The calculation is on the bottom there. And uh, it's really hard to go around saying 9.47 trillion kilometers with one light year, right? You can't, you're not talking those terms. We talk in terms of light years. So our nearest star up front to our sun is 4.4 and a quarter light years away, 4.25 light years away. Um, but our galaxy, our galaxy is only about 100,000 uh, wide, so full of stars, full of nebulae. These are star-forming regions, star clusters that have formed out of nebulae and slowly spreading out to space. Stars die. The remnants from stars that explode violently or those that are dying. And exoplanets, which are planets around other 
stars that we can't see, but we can detect them because occasionally they pass in front of a star and it just dips the light ever so slightly. They're called exoplanets. So we've found over 5,000 of those to date. And that's only happened in the last 30 years. Planets around other stars. There's over 5,000 that we've found using that basic technique. Extra galactic stuff that outside our galaxy, now this starts millions to billions of light years away. Okay, the universe as we know it is, is believed to extend out to 13.8 billion light years. Right? And uh, there we have galaxies, we have clusters of galaxies, we have galac galaxies interacting, uh, colliding, supernovae, stars in those galaxies exploding and outshining the entire galaxy. Um, and quasars. So I'm going to show you some photos of pretty well every one of those things tonight. It's taken from my backyard or nearby. <laughs> All right, so, so think about things in, um, in those sort of scales, but the Milky Way, most of what you see when you go outside is the Milky Way, and you need special devices to go beyond that. All right, so amateur astronomers uh, can observe pretty well the same things that professionals can observe. Let's, let's go over here. Um, and they engage in this hobby out of passion for, the, for sheer enjoyment, right? Well, they do it in various ways. Uh, recreational astronomy, uh, where we just like looking through a telescope. I like taking photographs of a telescope, right? That's recreational stuff. You do it just for pure joy. Outreach, that's where you're sharing your knowledge of the night sky with others. I mean, this is effectively an outreach event. I'll be sharing knowledge about astronomy with you folks. Scientific activities, you can actually do quite a lot of science. Um, you can contribute to exoplanet observations. You can measure the profiles of asteroids. Uh, NASA is very interested in that because they, they're sending missions out to um, meet up with asteroids and they don't know what these things look like until they get there. So if one of these asteroids is casting a shadow over parts of Australia or South Australia, as they were doing a few months ago, then they're all out here running around the countryside getting as many help as they can to, to measure that shadow and to decide what the shape of that asteroid is. Uh, or you may want to measure supernovae and see um, brightnesses and how they vary with time. You may want to measure how other stars vary in brightness over time. Or you may want to, you may want to get into discovery. You may want to go then discover something. Right? So um, one of our members, uh, Bill Bradfield, probably our most famous man, member, um, he discovered 18 comets visually by getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning, whatever, and just scanning the sky, driving out. 50 kilometres away to a dark sky site before going to work, I might have, <laughs> scanning the horizon. And the idea was if it's cloudy in Japan, I might be able to beat, might be able to beat the uh, comet chasers in Japan, right? And that's what he, he did and found 18 of them. And they're all named after him. He was a sole discoverer. Pretty amazing stuff. And that's his telescope. That's one of his telescopes. That's just a wooden frame locked together and uh, an old photographic and larger lens, I believe, as well. Very rudimentary stuff. Can you use that table there? The table, well, the first column is the number of the comet. Um, comets are designated a particular name based on the year they're discovered and the time and when they're discovered in the year. So that's the name of the comet. The hours is how long he searched the night sky for that comet. Mm. So the first one took him 260 hours. But number six only took him nine hours <laughs> after he found his previous one. So, and then the date of discovery and how bright, and that's just the magnitude of brightness scale and all that. Okay, so you can do discovery. All right, so again, here are some solar system objects. Pretty obvious what they are. There's a comet, that's the comet that was around um, about 18 months ago. Um, we thought it'd actually be quite bright. Um, I, I could pick it up just from the city area, a uh, city with a pair of binoculars like these. But the average, um, the average person would not have had any hope, really. But it came up beautifully in a, in a small telescope. So we were putting these images out online through Facebook uh, every day. Um, a little further afield, nebulae and um, uh, dust clouds in, in the Milky Way. So these are star forming regions. Uh, that one on the, the left um, is actually known as the Running Chicken Nebula. <laughs> Some of these have very unusual names. <laughs> Um, that's the famous Orion Nebula in the middle, and there's uh, the Trifid Nebula next to it. And they're quite, they are the actual colours that, that you get when you photograph these objects, right? not when you look through a telescope. We'll talk more about that. 
Well, that jumped. Very touchy. Okay. Um, star clusters, you've got tons and tons of stars in the Milky Way. Um, I think the number's uh, about 100 star. About 100 billion stars, where we're at. All right. And um, it's between 100 and 200 billion stars. I forget the number. And then there's at least that many number of galaxies that are known, if not two or three times that. So there's a lot of stars in the universe. Um, the middle one just shows um, uh, some dark matter. Or no, I shouldn't use the term dark matter. It's just um, a dark cloud in front of a background of stars that's silhouetted there. And the other one is a globular star cluster, which contains, this one here contains, Sutton's estimate contain upwards of 3 million stars in itself. Okay, so we have some other unusual objects. So these are stars behaving badly. Um, the one on the left is basically so energetic, it's just shedding bits of itself out into space. Uh, some of these stars, are, it's actually a very rare type of star uh, known as, as an O-type, and it basically sheds material into space. And you might just be able to make out there's even another shell of material there. So they, they don't last very long, these stars. They, they die after a few million years, I think. Uh, the middle one is a planetary nebula, uh, known as planetary nebula. There's a little star in the middle and that's coughed all this other stuff out. And the one on the right is, is a supernova remnant. That's a star that exploded in our galaxy about a thousand years ago. It was observed by uh, Chinese astronomers and others around the world. And, and it even is visible during the daytime. So, and now it looks like that. Uh, these bits are sort of slowly expand, continue to expand into space. And then we go a little further afield, we start looking at galaxies near our galaxy. We have companion galaxies that are nearby. Uh, the Magellanic Clouds you may have heard of. One's, um, the large one is about 160,000 light years, and the other one is uh, about 210,000 light years. And if you look at the, um, the large Magellanic Cloud with special filters, you can actually see nebulae and star-forming regions in that galaxy, uh, which you normally don't see in the galaxies that are quite far away. Uh, the middle one is a typical galaxy. I think it's about eight, I forget the distance, about eight million light years away. It's quite a nice sight. And then we have a chain of galaxies called Macarian's chain. Um, right there. So star formation actually results in the process of the life cycle of star of a star results in all these unusual objects in the night sky. It all starts from some nebula, some cloud of dust and gas in the middle there. And, and gravity does its thing and eventually a star may will pop out of that. Star formation is actually a very, um, quite a rare process actually in the, in the, um, in the universe and certainly in our galaxy. So uh, a, a small star may appear um, and that sort of follows that path on the left and eventually after billions of years, it runs out of consuming its own um, uh, high, um, hydrogen and basically starts to swell up and eventually will cough out a planetary nebula. And I showed you a couple of photos there. And then bits of that, what's left from the planetary nebula go back into space and star forming regions sort of pick up again these nebula. If the star is very massive, it'll actually end up in a, with a, a red giant very quickly within a few million years. And when that runs out of, consumes all its fuel, it basically collapses uh, within seconds. And you get the supernova event where there's just a catastrophic explosion of the star. And that creates neutron stars and black holes and more stuff into space. And those, those effects of planetary nebulae and the supernova actually produce a lot of the elements that are in your body. <laughs> All right. uh, though they're not formed, that, they're just not there to begin with. They have to be formed through these violent uh, explosions. Um, so they, they are then dispersed through the universe and those, those materials combine and here we are. All right, more than that. Anyhow, the universe is enormous. The distances are just absolutely mind boggling. So I'll talk now about observing the night sky. Okay, so there's lots of ways you can do it. You can just go there and look at it with your eyes, go with a pair of binoculars, I've got a pair here tonight, and, or use a telescope. And um, the thing about this is the size of the aperture on your eye or the pair of binoculars or the front of the telescope is what captures all the light. All right, so if you compare that to, say, human eye, if you call that, say, one LGP, light gathering power, 
And a pair of binoculars like these would have somewhere between 50 to 100 times the light gathering power of the human eye, which is why you would want to use binoculars. You go out there, you can gather a lot more light, and off you go. But if you use a telescope, you're now picking up 250 to several thousand times the light because you've got a larger aperture that's capturing all these photons, right? So telescopes are good. Um, now, Dobsonian telescopes basically are the best low-cost visual telescope and mount in one design. Um, you can buy separate mounts, but these are all combined in one. And uh, the classic one is solid tube. The middle one, it can collapse like this one here. Uh, and the one on the right has a go-to, has an electronic, it's got a hand controller, which you can use to basically tell the telescope to go and find things for you. Just type it in, off, you go, off it goes. Um, variations in those uh, Dobsonian telescopes, I've got one here tonight, uh, these tabletop Dobsonians, they're just smaller, more compact, you just grab, pick it up, go outside, have a quick look, pack it away. And again, they can be completely manually controlled, or uh, you can use uh, an app on your phone uh, just to control the telescope and it will go and find objects for you. So that's a basic idea. So when you hear go to, that's what it means. In terms of optical telescopes, uh, there are really three types. There's, um, there's a, oh, by the way, um, don't go out and, and buy one of these before the end of the presentation. <laughs> Wait till the end. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Just in case you're getting excited. All right. So there are three types of optical telescopes. One's a refractor and big glass at the front. The other one's a reflector. And the third one is a combination of both called a catadioptric. And the big difference between them is, um, the gen these are general terms, um, the refractors typically have a shorter focal length, about 500 millimetres. Uh, think of focal length as when you have a telephoto uh, lens on a camera, uh, you know, 300 millimetres was considered quite a large uh, focal length. Well, 500 millimetres in telescope land is, is really short. Uh, um, most of the reflectors, including the Dobsonians I just had up there, they're all based on their reflectors as well. If you look through the bottom of this one, you'll see a big mirror. Um, they're about a thousand millimeters, about a meter focal length. And the catadioptrics are typically two meters or larger. And the reason for that is one gives you a very wide field of view, which is the refractor. Uh, the middle one will give you something more medium, and the other one gives you a very narrow field of view. So, and, and that's basically, well, the animation actually works well. And that's basically how the refractor works. Light comes in, it's refracted. That's me, is that me? <laughs> 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 oh, it must be this animation. Yeah. I think so. Okay, uh, the reflector, light comes in the front end, bounces off the mirror at the back, try not to move. Comes back, bounces off another mirror, the secondary, which is at 45 degrees, and sends the light out. There's an eyepiece at the end of the refractor or an eyepiece where the, the light comes out, and that's what enables you to focus. The other one uh, is a, has a big lens at the front, um, which extends the focal length, starts bending the light, has another mirror, bounces off a big mirror, has another mirror on the back of the uh, lens <coughs> at the front and then sends it down the tube and you look through that. Let's get out of that. Oh, that's better. No, it's not. <laughs> oh, I'll take a drink for a moment. All right, so that's that's uh, basically how those three scopes work. And, and the thing is, which is the right telescope for you? It's a, it's a question that's often asked and um, the question that comes back is... Uh, well, what do you want to do with your telescope, right? What do you want to do? And it's a silly question because most people haven't got a clue what they want to do with a telescope, right? So the correct answer is you need one of each, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> well, I am a little bit, anyhow. All right, so those, those telescopes there, they're just optical tubes, OTAs, right? That you need to put them on a mount. The Dobsonians have a mount built into the design. You just turn it this way. In fact, it's, it's basically like the people in the audience. Basically, you can do this. You basically do that. You turn it around, up and down, and that's it. Really simple stuff. Now, this one's computer control. I'll drop it down a bit. But you can operate it manually as well. 
mounts are very simple. Now, these mounts, we go back, so you may need a mount um, if you've got just an optical tube. Uh, the one on the left is uh, our tazimuth. It's just, uh, it just means the same as what you just saw. It just moves in azimuth and altitude. And it's a grab and go. You just put a small telescope on it, just go aside and have a quick look, bring it back inside. Um, then one next to it, the second one along, is actually a computer controlled version of the same thing. You control it with uh, your phone or a hand controller, maybe. I'm not sure about this one, but it's, yeah, smartphone. So you just use a phone or a tablet to control it. Mount your telescope on the side, very similar to this. The other two are equatorial uh, telescopes or have, provide some altazimuth capability. Uh, these telescopes are designed to be aligned with the rotation axis of the Earth. And the reason for that is the Earth rotates. We turn towards the east. So stars in the east appear to sort of come up and all the stuff sets in the west, right? Uh, so the whole idea is I'm going to align my mechanics for my telescope so I can easily follow the rotation of the Earth and counter it. Otherwise, um, things will move in strange ways. Um, and that's, the, that's why these mounts are a little different, and that's the reason. So how do you go about finding them? Well, you can cheat and, and get one of these sheets. <laughs> this is not an ad. <laughs> not a paid ad, of this. So you can download a map. Uh, and these are free. You can print it out. I've only got a couple of copies here. Um, or you can just use it on your tablet or on your computer. Tablet's probably a bit easier if you want to go outside. And what it does is uh, I produce these every month. I've been doing this since the year 2000. And I produce versions for the Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere and Equatorial regions. And um, they vary from month to month. And they also include a calendar of events. Actually, if I go there, you might be able to read the uh, sky calendar there as what's happening every, every night. But there's a whole lot of objects on there. And this is an all sky view from horizon to horizon. And, um, Notice that east and west seem to be the wrong way around. Yeah. No, they're not the wrong way around. They're the correct way around. Because when you're looking at, a, for example, a map of Australia from space, west is over there and east is over there. When you're on the ground looking up, the east and west are switched. <laughs> right? That's why. So don't send me an email telling me I've got things the wrong way around. That's, that's the reason. Anyhow, to use these, um, uh, the point in the middle is the, the point directly above your heads. They're set, for the, they're set up for a certain time and date. And this is early July 8 p.m., which is yeah, in about now. So if you want to go outside and see uh, where the planet Venus is, you rotate this. In fact, the instructions are at the bottom. If you just read the instructions, which follow the, um, the horizon, uh, you'll quickly work out how these work. I'll do this. You go outside, look west, you line it up with west, and then you can see from the bottom of the horizon, from the horizon all the way up to the point above, you can work out where the constellation stars are and other objects. On the back, I've got a list of objects you can see, or some basic instructions. Objects you can see with your eyes, objects you can see with binoculars, and objects you can see with a telescope that you need a telescope to see. So I've only got a couple of copies here, but if you want to grab one, just go for it, or just download a copy um, from Sky Maps. All right, another another way you can find stuff in the sky is with a planisphere. And I forgot, I was thinking when I was driving, I forgot to bring one along. And it's just basically a disc that rotates uh, within a cover. And you basically dial in the mechanically, turn it by hand, uh, the date, um, the date and the time. And it will show you the stars that are, and everything else is above the, the horizon at that time. Uh, very handy. Um, or you can go all out and get a get a big atlas, and these are sort of not that popular these days. Um, but they're like the old street directories. In fact, the whole sky is carved up like latitude and longitude lines, and there are it's basically an atlas that shows you lots and lots of stars and lots of DSOs, deep sky objects. So the first one there has about nine thousand stars. The next one has about thirty thousand stars. And the one on the right has about 200,000 stars and about 15,000 deep sky objects, galaxies, star clusters, nebulae, etc. So they're handy. Um, a lot of people use them still, but um, what most people have moved to are electronic apps or apps that you just run on your phone or your tablet. And uh, one of these is free. This is Stellarium. 
Uh, you can go to, in fact, there's a, you can get it on your phone, you can get it on the, as a, an application on your desktop, or you can just run it in the web environment. If you go to stellarium-web.org, just run it, in, run it in a browser. It'll show you the position, position of planets, uh, stars, constellations, uh, etc. Very handy. So that's free, Stellar Stellarium. Um, that's been around for a few years. <coughs> Excuse me, I, I, I prefer Sky Safari, which is another app I use on the desktop and also on an iPad and on my phone. And uh, it's, it, you have to pay a little bit for this one. It's often discounted even further. Uh, but, you know, I've got two and a half million stars or 100 million stars, um, three million galaxies or 750,000 objects in the solar system. I mean, it's all there. And you just zoom in and out and you find it will answer most questions for you. So I tend to use that one, and these programs tend to be able to control your telescope as well. I'm fairly sure they can drive this one here. Um, anything that's got go-to, they can usually control. And uh, the way you find stuff, uh, objects in the night sky, you look at some bright stars and you can star hop. So you might find Alpha and Beta Centauri there, which are just above Crux, which is the Southern Cross. You'll notice a, if you want to go to Omega Centauri, which is that circle with a little uh, cross through it, you can hop from beta to another star, and then about the same distance, you'll find Omega Centauri, which is that massive star cluster I showed you at the start, that globular star cluster. And you can go out there, and from a dark sky site, you'll be able to see it with your eyes. It's a fuzzy blob, fuzzy star. Use a pair of these or any binoculars, 7 by 50, 10 by 50s, 8 by 40s, you'll see a, like a ball of stars in space. You won't be able to resolve the stars. You won't be able to see them as individual stars. You need a telescope for that. Uh, but that's how you start off. Really, really easy to do. Or you can get a, a fancy computer control telescope or mount, and you have a hand controller and just go Omega Centauri. <laughs> and off it goes. That's it. Or you may not even want a hand controller. A, lot, um, a number of companies have stopped producing these hand controllers now. They realize people are just running everything off their phones. So you have an app and you just go, Omega Centauri. Or show me what's up, what's interesting, bang, <laughs> and it'll go there. Um, not quite that simple, but uh, that's that's the idea. And by the way, um, uh, nothing works as guaranteed. Right? Uh, sometimes you've got to put a bit of effort into this to, to understand it, understand what's involved. But that's the intent. And, and I actually find both of those work fine for me. Uh, this new technology that's out uh, called plate solving has been around for a few years now. This is particularly handy if you're looking for really, really faint stuff. What the technology does is you tell the telescope to go to an object. It'll do its best to go to that object, but um, it will take, it will then take, almost certainly won't be centered in the field of view. The telescope will then take a, an image, maybe a two or three second exposure. It'll look at the stars in that field of view, realize where it's pointing versus where it was told to go, and then adjust its, its uh, position so the object is centered and does it in a few seconds. It's pretty amazing. And here it's been told to go to a bright star, Arcana, and within a few seconds, it's absolutely centered on, on, on the object. This is really handy for um, trying to locate those things that you can't see at all <laughs> from your backyard but you, you'll see later when I talk about cameras, uh, you'll be able to bring out through the photography. You have no hope in seeing where they are, but you're going from essentially navigating the sky with stars, and the telescope will point to that, that, that location. All right, so what will I see using a telescope? What will you see as opposed to what can you see? What will I see? So here's a lovely object. This is the this is the Triton Nebula. It's located, I think, about five thousand two hundred light years away. It's part of our our Milky Way. Uh, it's in Sagittarius. It has a designation M twenty. That's an astronomical term. You've got red nebula there. You've got blue nebula there. You've got stars all around, and you've got some dark nebula causing the the, the, the different veins in the or lanes in the uh, in the red part. So the red part is actually what's known as an emission nebula. It's glowing. It's actually glowing like neon lights. The stars in there are exciting. The gas is so much just glowing in that red colour. The blue stuff is actually a reflection nebula. What that means, it's a bit like that blue sky. Why? That's blue. 
there's dust clouds there and the stars there are just reflecting off that dust, creating this blue light, much like, which is why we have a blue sky during the day. So it's quite a stunning object, right? Um, beautiful um, uh, to uh, imagine, see in a photograph, but what does it look like? Well, uh, oh, you can star hop to it. <laughs> you can actually use the current map to star hop to it. Uh, there's the, you find the Scorpius, um, the Scorpion. It's quite easy to see over in the, you can see with the eyes. It's over in the eastern sky in the early evening. Below that is the teapot, which is part of Sagittarius. It's just an asterism, it's not a constellation. And you just follow the lid of the teapot up and that's where M20 is. Don't confuse it with its brightest, with its brighter neighbor, M M8, which is the lagoon nebula. Um, but that's how you find it if you want to start hot. Not real easy. All right, so but what will I see using a telescope? And the bottom line is prepare for disappointment. Okay, this is what they don't show on the photographs on the packaging for telescopes. <laughs> you rush out there and buy one. Well, okay, so here's the answer. That's what you're saying, right? Now that is the view. It's a it's a drawing it's, um, that someone made using an eight inch, which is a diameter Newtonian telescope. Uh, he used a, a filter called a UHC. That's the ultra high contrast filter. <laughs> right, this is ultra high contrast stuff here, and he observed this from a desert in Israel and a, quite a dark sky site, quite dark. Right? That's what you like to see. Let me put that next to the. Uh, let me let me go a bit further. Well, uh, this is these are um, these drawings actually hand drawn uh, on white paper. Then the guy invert the person inverts them and then scans them in. Um, so yeah, there's another representation there. He's just not. It's not just him being a bad drawer, <laughs> sketch artist. And the one on the right there is actually a 28 inch diameter telescope. That is massive. <laughs> What is that? That's that is enormous. I don't think I don't, I don't know of anyone who's got a 28 inch diameter telescope. So he drew that, which is which is not bad, right? Um, it took me eight and a half hours to do that sketch. Very dedicated, right? And I'm sure it was a dark sky location as well. Just putting it side by side. So which of those do you prefer? <laughs> which one inspires you? <laughs> It says, wow, awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, the one on the right is actually, um, that was a 60 second exposure. I took that um, a couple of weeks ago on the 10th of June. That was our last clear night, I think, in Adelaide. Uh, I took that from my backyard in Prospect, and I'm sure there was a, some sort of footy game on as well, or something from Adelaide Oval lining up the whole sky. So I did that from my backyard. That's a 60 second exposure. It was done with a smaller tel telescope than the one on the left. Um, and it was done from a light polluted sky. So how the heck can I do that? That's all you can see when you look through a telescope. All right. And which would you prefer? I'm not selling scopes, but I do not. Uh, and that's the comparison of the 28 inch scope, the massive scope. And if you want to know what that scope looks like, uh, that's it there on the left. It's a do-it-yourself job. People build telescopes, and this is this is enormous, right? And that's mine, mine on the on the side there, uh, which is set up to take uh, take up take photography, take images. Okay, so what's going on here? So it's not just that that object, uh, which is not an excessively bright object. Uh, Orion Nebula on the top, top left there is a bright object, and that's not a bad rendition of what it looks like when you look through a telescope of this aperture. Uh, but there's a number of other objects there as well, uh, some galaxies, and what you're seeing is faint smudges. That's most of what you're going to see from these, and unfortunately you can't quite see the one on the right there, top right. So stars actually, and in stars and star clusters actually appear pinpoint, and they appear quite respectable in telescopes. But extended objects uh, like these other ones that appear blurry, um, yeah, they're not what people normally expect you're going to see, right? But that's not the end of the, the game. And, the, and these, are these are taken from a dark sky location, by the way. 
So what's going on here? Well, the problem is the Mark I eyeball is really, really good at what it does, but it doesn't do astronomy very well. It doesn't perform in low light. It can't see colour. There's no colour in those images. It won't see colour in low light. All right. And it has an exposure effectively of uh, about one-tenth of a second, which is fixed. Um, and um, it does tend to degrade with time. Some of you may have noticed that. <laughs> and there's a photochemical reaction happening here. Photons come in, there's a chemical reaction that takes place in the eye, and that's sent back to your brain. And there's this dance that goes on, and, and yeah, this is what you see. Right? On the other hand, if you use one of these dedicated cameras, uh, astronomy cameras, and these are just fancy cameras, camera bodies with the same chips you'll find in digital SLRs, in your phones, etc. cetera. Uh, if you use one of those, photons come in, they're converted to electrons, and they, they're mapped onto an array of uh, pixels, very tiny pixels. If you have opened up a digital SLR, you'll see the array at the back. And um, the, uh, these, the exposure times can be anything from one thousandth of a second up to several minutes. I've indicated five minutes there, right? Um, and you can do more with that data, which is now digital, than you can with just an analog signal. Besides that, they have perfect colour rendition at low light, right? We know exactly how they perform in low light. So you get to see the colour. So it's no surprise then uh, when uh, you look, you see what's on the left with your Mark I eyeball. And uh, that's the good eyeball from a really dark location <laughs> or what you can see from a uh, single exposure uh, with one of these cameras on attached to a telescope. And uh, I did mention uh, the image on the left was taken at, uh, at a location, in the, it was a desert location. Um, it's Bortle 3, which is reasonably dark. And Bortle 7 is my backyard. Uh, prospect and there's a scale here. These are this is a light pollution scale. So Bortle Seven is the second one on the left there. Pretty well nothing. Right? You won't much of the stuff you won't see when you look up at night sky at all. Um, Bortle Three is a what it, they refer to as a rural sky. It's a third one from the right. And our facility at Stockport Observatory and out at Meldanda, the dark sky reserve, is around Bortle Two. It's darker than that, that view. So I'm operating in a city, that red city suburban area, and I'm getting stuff that's remarkably more interesting. All right, so light pollution, this is a global problem and it ain't getting any better. This is a map. You can see the hotspots where they are. And there's been publications that come out in recent times and research showing that um, it's actually getting brighter by 7 to 10% per year, has been over the last 10 years or so. And, and uh, part of the reason for that is the new LED lights that you may have seen around the streets. You probably, many of you would remember the old, very orange lights, deep orange almost. They were known as low pressure sodium vapor lamps. And then they started bringing out these pink ones at high pressure. But the low pressure ones were in one very narrow part of the spectrum. So you can actually block it out. You can actually block out that light with correct filters, right? High pressure became a problem. LED lights are broad spectrum emitters. They, they emit light across the entire spectrum. And the blue stuff in the blue part of that light, which is, by the way, not very good for you at night, um, bounces off. Uh, streets, anything else, and goes up in the sky and really is really adding a lot to the light pollution problem. So councils are rapidly adopting LED lights because they they cost less, they have a longer life, etc. But the problem is they're actually uh, not that great at all for looking at the night sky. So what can you do about it? Well, uh, you move to the desert. Uh, you can sort of work out where Adelaide is on that quite easily. Uh, there's no escaping the light pollution in Adelaide. Right? These are satellite-derived maps. But we're right in the middle of that red zone, which is Bortle 7. All right, so what can you do? You can install better outdoor lighting at home. That's a good place to start. <laughs> Have a look at your own lighting at home. Make sure it's pointing where it's needed, not going straight up. 
help educate authorities regarding the installation of better outdoor lighting. That's a very long-term thing, and more often than not, we miss the boat, and they've got these lights now for the next decade. Uh, you can get away, <laughs> run away, absolutely from a dark sky site. Use filters, uh, light pollution or narrow band. Um, narrow band up to, um, are just very, very narrow filters uh, that allow you to see particular parts of uh, nebulae. The hydrogen, which is that red glow, or that green glow from the oxygen three. Uh, so you may want to just let only that light through and block everything else out. Uh, and that works quite well from uh, people's backyards in light blue zones. Or you may want to transition to doing some electronic observing, also known as EAA. Now, I'll just go back to that, those images I had earlier um, <coughs> of the Triple Nebula in 20. I had one image, 60 seconds. And there's a process known as stacking images where you get con take consecutive images. Is that changing? No. So you take two consecutive images, each are 60 seconds, and you put one on top of the other. So the software does that for you automatically as you're taking photos. Take a third one, add it on top, take a fourth one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually this image stack um, does something really neat. And what it does that's really neat is that the signal, uh, if, you, if you think of two images to begin with, two images, uh, if you put two together, the signal, which is the good part of what you want to see, doubles. The bad part that you don't want to see is typically noise and light pollution can be thought of as noise. In fact, random noise, which means it's not, never twice at the same place, right? So when you add noise on top of noise, eventually the noise starts to cancel out. Okay, you double the signal, but mathematically, you actually the noise only goes up by the square root of two. Okay, at, at best, uh, and you keep doing this. So you can't really see it here, but that image on the right, that's 10 images. It looks much nicer than that one now. This is a close-up. And uh, the top image is uh, one, one image alone, the top right. Then we have two, then we have five, and then we have 10. And we're just coming through a slice of that, that image I just had on the screen. You see all that, that pixelation, that weird colored stuff, that speaking stuff, that's noise. And gradually that gets less and less. Right? So this is from my backyard, Bortle 7. Now there are people doing this in Tokyo, right? Where it's Bortle off the scale. <laughs> Um, and they, they actually end up taking four to 500 images and stacking them. But the software does all the work and you don't hang around and click and click. Right? It's all automatic. You go to bed, you wake up and it's all there. What happens with the movement of the Earth? Ah, the equatorial mount follows the stars. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. <laughs> it better. <laughs> that's, why you pay all, that's why you pay all the money, right? <laughs> So the idea is when you're taking these images, um, you can take hundreds of these if you're into astrophotography and gradually your image will appear much, much nicer. Now, there's no escaping the fact that um, a dark sky site is much better to do this sort of photography from. But this is how you, this is the same process that they use. You know, there to do an astrophotography or whether you're only taking a handful of shots, handful of images, right? Which is what I tend to do. All right, and the noise is everything, camera circuitry, thermals, light pollution, sky glow, satellite travels, they tend to get washed out, which is kind of neat as well. If you want to learn more about the technology, there's a guy called Dr. Robin Glover. He's written an app called Sharp Cap. How are we going for time, by the way? Okay. Um, deep sky, CMOS imaging. Um, if you want to watch his YouTube video, he explains all the lovely mathematics behind uh, a lot of this and also gives some very real practical solutions on how to do this. Right, so he's, uh, he's a, he's an outstanding presentation. He's also the producer of that program called Sharp Cap. I think that's still available for free and there's a paid version. And you can use that to do all sorts of imaging. All right, so another thing you can do is uh, apply some minimal processing. And all I've done there is I've taken the image on the left, the 22, uh, 22 minutes of data. And all I've done there is um, uh, in, sa increase the saturation slightly. And uh, what else have I done? Not much. Maybe up the contrast a notch. So you now go from that, which I, by the way, I can sit, watch real time when I'm at a telescope as the image is actually filming in front of me on my iPad, right? So I'm not doing this after hours or later. It's happening there and there in real time. Uh, but if you want to do a bit more processing, you can do that. Um, it will produce a more respectable image. 
All right, which takes me to electronically assisted astronomy. So this is this is the idea. This idea has been around for a little while now, and it's evolving. And um, this is essentially the near real-time imaging and display of celestial objects using live stacking te uh, techniques and enhancement as the data has been stacked or integrated. As the data is coming in, you're stacking and you're also enhancing the images slightly. And you're not doing any post-processing like post-processing like what I did a moment ago, which is increase the saturation or change the contrast a bit, although I'm sure that'll be worked into this. Uh, you're grabbing the images in real time, effectively, and displaying them. So the goal here is to maximise the observing experience. Remember what the alternative is. <laughs> and timeliness is more important than image quality. So we're happy to trade off some image quality, but I want a, I want a, I want a half decent image, right? That will get people excited. And the uh, question that's often asked is, is this observing or is it astrophotography? Well, it's, it's both. Um, but it applies, it uses astrophotography techniques to extend the visual observing into areas that were just not accessible previously. Question? So you can use it on a screen. Or an iPad or your phone. Real time. <laughs> okay, but there's more to it than just that. Uh, it actually changes the whole paradigm of how you do visual astronomy. Um, deeper, you can see yeah, small aperture telescopes can often uh, see, you'll see faint, very faint objects in detail, and you'll often exceed the visual performance of larger telescopes, much larger telescopes. I just showed you a seven and a half inch telescope exceeding the performance of a 28 inch telescope, right? The visual performance. Colour, you can see stuff in colour, not shades of grey. Um, you can bust through light pollution to a certain extent, but you prefer dark sky sites always. Uh, people who have disabilities, degraded eyesight, mobility issues, they can't even use or approach telescopes or use them. You get around all of that. And you can look at lots and lots of objects in one night. Um, new sharing experiences. You can broadcast this stuff live on the internet, which we started doing during COVID. We couldn't get together, so we had uh, star parties online. We did a tour of the universe. <laughs> we started with the moon, moon landing sites. We're showing the moon live. We started going further and further out, showing nebulae, galaxies, planets. We did this live. We had um, that was the first time we did it. We only, I think, we only had about three and a half thousand people tune in from mostly from South Australia. Um, but then we did it for a couple of lunar eclipses and we had like 30, 40,000 people, from usually around the world, tuning in to watch live. <laughs> right? and that was often with very small telescopes, much smaller than this thing, <laughs> capturing the images and broadcasting. And also the impact is, is huge for uh, uh, outreach. So you probably can't read that at the top, but basically what it says is conventional. Can we get rid of that? Yeah, I'm sure. Can I leave it? I'm not sure. Uh, I'll leave it. I don't worry. Anyhow, con the conventional astronomy outreach experience has been used for decades very well, but it can be, and, and it is actually quite underwhelming for many people. You line up, you look through a scope, and you see this fuzzy grey thing. What am I looking at? You're looking at a number. <laughs> Apart from the moon and the bright planets and a few of the bright nebulae, that's it, right? And it's a complete non-experience for other people. Right. Absolutely terrible, terrible stuff. Uh, and often if they look through there, they don't know what they're looking at either. Uh, so you can do this. You can capture the images and you put them up on the screen. So we've done that as well uh, in physical settings. And kind of how, how it works, <laughs> bit of magic. Uh, technical problems, yes. <laughs> Wi-Fi, yes. Getting things to work, yes, uh, but it does work. Um, so the way I tend to do this at home is I have a telescope out in the backyard. Uh, it connects, the telescope connects to my Wi-Fi network at home. I sit in the front of the house, either on the lounge or next to my computer, and all the imagery appears on my iPad. So I then, I see stuff that's coming up on my screen and I just randomly go and look at stuff sometimes. And so I don't know what that is. So you go on Google, go to Wikipedia, 
you learn quickly learn what's going on there. It's it's pretty amazing. It's a different way of uh, doing them, observing for yourself, but you can also share it, right? It's eminently shareable, and you can have people talking to that and sharing that experience, right? No second guessing of what, what has been observed. You take the questions from the audience. It's pretty powerful stuff. And this is what it looks like. Uh, oops, that's what it looks like. This is an event in Arizona. And I'm sure we did this before they did. But this, uh, this is a lovely photo for the backdrop. Um, they've got screens up there. They've got people seated. There's a computer at the front there and a telescope and the guys using a blue laser. Now, I don't have a blue laser. I've got a green laser. I'd love to import a blue laser, but I don't want to go through the permit process for that. Uh, but anyhow, people sit around and they have a, a communal experience around the universe and stuff that, that um, that'll be observed by the telescopes is put up on those screens. Pretty amazing stuff, right? And even better, I mean, I've I've done it with uh, with my iPad and my scope at observing nights where you just give the control, the iPad, to a young child, a six or seven-year-old. They take control of the telescope. The telescope magically moves, uses plate solving, centres the object, starts taking images, and they have suddenly they have the Trifid Nebula or something else in front of them. And then I airdrop that image to their phone and they walk away with the image. <laughs> or anyone else who wants it. Everyone wants the images, right? So we share the images then and there with people. And they go put them up on social media, they enhance them, they muck around with them. They get pretty excited, right? So it's it's a great way of extending the outreach. All right, so what gear do you need? Uh, okay. Uh, good, there's good news, bad news, good news and bad news, right? Uh, but it's generally getting better. Everything is available off the shelf, which is good. Um, you probably guess by now some of this stuff might be a bit expensive, uh, but the good news is um, it's coming down rapidly. Um, explain why and why you shouldn't rush out and buy that other telescope just yet. Um, it's much easier than astrophotography. <coughs> astrophotography is the most difficult type of photography, hands down. You will spend hours upon hours gathering data um, we're talking exposures, 10, 20, 30, 50, 80 hours, 100 hours over many nights. You have tons and tons of data and you will then be processing that data automatically, manually, flattening it. And you'll spend almost as much time that you did capturing the images in uh, processing the data. We're talking weeks potentially for some images and people like doing that, which is fine. But we can't do that when we're trying to share stuff then and there, right? Uh, the bad news is there's no escape in the need for perseverance. Not everything works as advertised. We need to put in a bit of effort to make sure it works, but there's lots of resources around these days. Uh, there's way, multiple ways in which you can configure a system to do this. Um, you get all the bits and pieces on the left there. You can run a laptop, run a special, a special device called a Pole Master on the left there, which is basically helps you find where the South Celestial Pole is. Or on cables, you might want cameras, a couple of cameras, you want focusing and software, and you just put it together with whatever you've got. And that works for a lot of people. Right? Grab whatever telescope you've got, start putting these bits together. Maybe you don't need it all, but you, you can do a lot of it. Uh, the one in the middle is one of my telescopes. It's a small refractor, 80 millimeters, 80 millimeters objective, which I bought back in 2009 for visual use. Works great. I mean, take it outside, have a quick look, pack it away. Right? But it's infinitely better here and easily outperforms 15, 16 inch diameter telescopes. Right? Easily outperforms it on the visuals alone. Um, or these robotic things have come out. This one you can't get anymore. It's already done. It's done its dash, came out. It was one of the first ones out there, the Stellina. Uh, but this is really the brains uh, behind my setup, and many people have taken this on board. It's actually like a, a mini computer. It's actually a Raspberry Pi that's been evolved. And it basically does all these things for you automatically or <laughs> guides you. And it's the best interface you can imagine. Um, so many, many people have bought these to facilitate their imaging, whether it's astrophotography or whether it's EAA. So it'll do polar alignment for you, help you find the South Celestial Pole. That used to take me well over an hour to do manually. Uh, it takes me under five minutes usually now, probably three minutes. <clears throat> 
it will take images of the night sky and basically tell, tell you to move the telescope this way or that way until you're perfectly aligned. It'll move the telescope, it'll do plate solving, it'll focus the telescope automatically, including as the temperature changes during the night, as things sort of shrink a bit or expand. It'll guide the telescope, which means it'll, um, it won't just track the stars, which this will do. Um, the gearing and the mechanical drives are not perfect, so there's slight um, variations. There's another mini telescope that sits on top and that's looking at stars and trying to work out where, if the star's going that way, I'm gonna send a pulse to the mount to, go, to follow the stars slightly. And these are minute movements, you can't see them, but it's just pulsing the mount all the time to guide, which is on top of tracking. It'll calibrate your images. So if you're taking, oh, I won't talk about that, it basically makes your images look better. <laughs> Live stacking, I've talked about stacking of images and it'll image multiple objects in a night and just put them in where you want to image, off you go. And you can use it remotely uh, with Wi-Fi or Ethernet. I won't talk to the camera, I've said enough about those. Uh, they're pretty amazing, uh, but they're all based on, there's no industry out there producing cameras or at least the chips or astro images or astronomy. These are all out of the digital SLR market and also the iPhone market. So they're changing and actually getting better over time. Uh, this is the dog's breakfast of all the bits and pieces. Uh, it's, abs it's an absolute Frankensteinian uh, creation. And as I said, that telescope, I didn't buy that to do this. I bought it just for visual. But you can buy all the bits and pieces and there's a lot there and you can assemble them any way you want. Uh, to achieve the end result. And in my case, that's this thing, which has a, you can see the Samsung SSD one terabyte drive <laughs> Velcro to the side. <laughs> right. um, and now they're, they're sort of labeled here. Um, there's humidity sensors to, and temperature sensors, which will, adjust, which, which will adjust your focusing for you during the night. The big red can at the back is the camera, the focuser is that cubic thing in the middle there, and on top is the mini computer. From the other side, uh, much the same, uh, got the guide camera and guide scope at the top there. There's a little red tube out at the top of the back. That's the one that's looking for any star movement. And that, that checks every one to two seconds. Okay, so it's checking constantly to make sure the scope is pointed and stays locked on the star. The blue box is actually a power management system. There's so many cables coming up from this from the ground. Uh, the idea is just to have one going into the blue box and then send all the power from that box. Um, otherwise, you'll get uh, cable snag, which happened to me. You snap the cables that get entangled while you're sitting inside, having a drink or something. <laughs> Things tearing itself apart. Uh, and, and the image on the left is you know, what your iPad tends to see. You zoom, you pinch and zoom, you change things as you're, as you're watching. Uh, that's my other scope. This is the 1,000 millimeter scope. It's max suit of Newtonian. It's got a big glass element at the front. A bit like one of those scopes I showed you earlier, the catadopterans. So it starts bending the light there. Um, and yes, you do need three telescopes. This is my third one. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was joking. <laughs> um, and this is a uh, another catadopteric. This is a, it's known as a Schmidt Cassegrain. The only difference between those last three photos is the telescopes. That same bit of kit, you just take it off and just put it on whatever scope you want. And why stop at three when you buy another one? Um, <laughs> so this is a much smaller portable rig and I have, I've only used it briefly in anger. Um, but again, it, I, I ended up buying the scope cash converters for under 400 bucks, which was an absolute steal. <coughs> Probably was an absolute steal, but anyhow. <coughs> But you just grab the bits off the other scopes and here you are, you now got another imaging platform. All right, so this is what's what has been coming out in terms of smart robotic telescopes. Um, I mentioned the Stellina earlier, the Vespera has taken over from it from that same company. They're both refractors, the ones on the left. Uh, the two in the middle are reflectors. And again, one of them has no eyepiece at all. I don't know if you notice it, one's got an eyepiece. Not a, that eyepiece is electronic. You don't actually see an image. You see an electronic image when you look through it. Uh, one without the eyepiece, they, they woke up and realized we don't need eyepiece, which is beam it to people's phones or tablets. The Dwarf 2 is a very unusual device. It's more of a telephoto lens. <coughs> Excuse me for a moment.
Um, that's only been on the market for a short while, very mixed reviews. And um, yeah, I don't know, but it is pitched towards um, observing nature. So there may be some interest around these quarters. So uh, bird photography, etc. You literally, all of these, you literally just plonk on the ground and they do the rest. There's no equatorial mounts here. They, uh, through GPS, they work out where they're pointing. They look at stars, work everything out, and they just go, they just run. They truly are smart telescopes, but the image quality on some of these is pretty ordinary, in my view. Uh, others would disagree. Um, and the one on the right there, the C star, which you can't really see. I've actually just well, I've got that on a, got that on a um, on the next slide. These are very small telescopes, by the way. <laughs> These are the apertures that are like 50 millimeters. Right? They've all got sensors built in. So that's that's a C star. Now, this is coming out in the next few weeks or so. Uh, um, this is probably the lowest cost uh, electronic telescope, smart telescope that's been produced to date. And it's flying off the shelves before it's actually hit, uh, appeared in the marketplace. All right, they sold hundreds of these in the first week they were announced um, a few weeks back. Uh, you can get your orders in before um, uh, the end of July, and they, they're 400 US. You can buy them in Australia, pre order them for $750, $750. And they're actually designed for use in, in light, designed for use in uh, light polluted environments. They actually have a special filter included now. That was only confirmed a few days ago. Uh, that, that enables uh, the light from nebulae, hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3, to come through. It's a dual, what's known as a dual band filter. Now, be aware, the, um, this one is, has only a 50 millimeter aperture, 250 millimeter focal length, which is not very long at all. Uh, so you won't get those tight images. You'll get quite wide fields of view. But the early images are very promising. So if you want to do your research on the C star, you've got a, you've got a few weeks to, to do that. Um, so C star before the special offer, I think they're 400, it's 400 US at the moment, it goes up to 500 US at the end of the, after that. Um, but that looks like an absolute winner. And that's produced by the company that produces all those red cameras and also the ASI Air, that mini computer. Uh, they're just going gangbusters uh, on, this, on these products. So the ASI Air, all that automation is actually built into this telescope. It's amazing. All right. Um, so what's this all look like when you start doing it in anger, right? Um, so I've got a few images here. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll just go through some of these are bright objects. Oh, we've seen that one already. And that was like 17, 30 second exposures. Um, but I've done 10 second exposures on this object and they come out just as nice. Perhaps a little dimmer. That's Amiga Centauri worth uh, finding on the star chart, worth looking at through binoculars and definitely worth looking at through a visual telescope. Oh, that's a close up of the its inners. Yeah, there's somewhere between 3 million plus stars in this thing. Uh, the jewel box, this is near um, the Southern Cross. It's often looked at at star parties as an, as an open star cluster. These stars are formed and they're just slowly spreading out in space. Quite colourful. Uh, you can see some of the colour here. Whoops, as you go. But looks, this, these stars actually look a lot better visually than they do in images like this. And it takes a lot of expertise to take decent images. These are, these are only 10 second exposures. 30 of them I've just stacked. Then it wasn't really trying. <laughs> Uh, so, yes, some objects will look better in a visual scope, particularly anything with stars or, or planets. This is M46. This is another open star cluster, and it just happens to have a little ring nebula in it, which is not associated with a star cluster at all. It just happens to be in the same line of sight. Um, so this is a whole lot of two-minute exposures here. Again, this was done from my backyard, and that's a close-up of that little ring nebula. And what that is... It's actually a sphere of gas that's been coughed out by that star. If you look carefully, you see a little, little tiny little blue star, like the seven o'clock position from the red, from the brighter star in the middle. And that's the star that's going through its dying phase of it's just coughing out the stuff. So the different colours, the red and the green, uh, relate to um, hydrogen gas, and the green is mostly oxygen, which is produced when stars uh, start getting violent uh, in terms of their, uh, their lives. So, yeah, it's a lovely little ring, and that'll be there for thousands of years like that, slowly expanding. 
Uh, nebula in general, this is Eta Carina. Uh, this is in our southern skies. Spectacular look at. It's quite a bright nebula. Spectacular look at through a telescope visually. Uh, but you quickly can't see a lot of the details. You see the bright bits, etc. That's an image I took from my backyard uh, over three consecutive nights with a full moon in the sky, which is our other uh, uh, enemy in the sky, apart from light pollution, right? Uh, so over three nights, uh, the software will go and automatically continue taking images, find it, center it exactly where you left it and keep going. Full moon in the sky. Mate, I could not see a single star in the sky. <laughs> and, this, and this thing was taking this, which is pretty amazing. But it did that because I used uh, what's called an L-extreme filter, one of those dual band narrow filters, just lets through oxygen and uh, hydrogen. And that's it. So there's enough in that nebula uh, to produce the image. Oops. Okay, went too far. This is another object. I just flew to this one night to see what it was. And it's, it's an O-type star, very violent, uh, just pushing out material into space. Uh, and that'll last like that for, this, this star will probably only live for about a million years or so, which is very, very short in terms of the life of stars. They're quite rare. You can start to see all the structure in this thing. But again, I did that from my backyard. Uh, images from dark sky locations look much better. And you can see more of the outer, the earlier shells that have been expelled from there. Uh, okay, so the running chicken, uh, which is a lovely sight, and um, it has these things called, um, you can't read it, they're called Thackeray's globules. They're these dark, the image on the right is not my image, by the way, and I'm standing over it. Um, that's an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see these, these dark uh, nodules, modules in, the, in uh, the nebula, and they're actually dark bits of matter that have just formed and haven't quite turned to a star yet. And that we know they're part of it because there's actually bits of nebula that they're not in the full, they're not foreground objects, they're actually part of it. There's actually bits of nebula that seem to wrap around them if you look carefully. You can see that in the photos you take from the backyard, not so much in this one, but um, yeah. So then you can explore the night sky and just hop around the night sky and look at this stuff, right? Um, this is another nebula, you can see it's a bit brown. This is just dust clouds in space. This one's known as the snake. Anyone guess why? <laughs> So the background is just stars. That's that's the Milky Way. They're just stars in the Milky Way, right? And so these things get silhouetted. They're definitely not part of the Milky Way. There, they're, they're in the foreground. Uh, they're about six hundred light years away. See so the one in the top left. There's quite dense. There's no stars sneaking through that. So quite stunning these things. Um, that was done from a dark, <coughs> a dark sky site. Okay, so I took this image when I was watching some of the World uh, Cup soccer one night. It's going on pretty late, and this was up uh, nice. I thought, well, I'll take an image of uh, the Tarantula Nebula. <clears throat> and I just let it run for uh, about one hour in the end. Um, and you will recall the earlier image where I had one photo, two photos, five photos, ten photos. If I'm doing a live event, I'll only, you only need a, few, a handful of photos. I just let this run on. And it produced this image, which is a lovely image. Now, this is a nebula in another galaxy, not our galaxy. Uh, this one is 160,000 light years. It's one of our companion galaxies in the Large Magellanic Cloud. I mean, it's, I'm not even trying. I'm just going outside. And I'm not even going outside. I'm just saying, go to this. It's, it's really has become ridiculously easy to do this. And this is another a real surprise. Uh, again, I was one of those random um, searches, I guess. I said, well, um, let's just go to NGC 2020. NGC is a catalog number, and I just said, oh, I'll just go to 2020. Never seen it before. Well, and I took this image. So what is it? <laughs> uh, so you go on Wikipedia right away. Ah, 2020 is that blue thing there that has that little star in the middle. That star in the middle is uh, a particularly um, energetic star called a wolf rayet star. It's putting out so much radiation. It's actually pushing all the gas out. You see that hollow, see that hollow ring effect around that star? It's got this lovely blue colour. I've not touched these, by the way. These, these come straight off the telescope. All the red stuff is hydrogen, uh, as is some of the white stuff. And I thought, well, this is worth um, enhancing a little bit. So I, I sort of made it contra a bit more contrasting. I put that image together. And this is in the Large Magellanic Cloud. I mean, the Large Magellanic Cloud, this companion galaxy, is just full of this stuff. Uh, and you don't see it. You don't see it visually when you look through your telescope. You, you need something like this to actually explore it. Fascinating stuff. But that image on the right, uh, that half of the image on the right, 
I'd seen that before somewhere. And where I'd seen that was here. <laughs> That's a photo from the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> Now, I'm not claiming that my telescope is the same as a, especially from Backyard Prospect, is the same as the Hubble Space Telescope. But I was just stunned. I couldn't believe what I was getting from home. I just go back one. Look at that from home. Now, I haven't touched the colours. That's how it comes out. I've spent years doing that, and I, I know they do. I know the Hubble people do. <laughs> Seems that way, doesn't it? But that, that inspires you even further to go back and take that image from a, the other image from a dark sky location and, and put more effort into it and perhaps process it out. Uh, in terms of galaxies, <coughs> uh, these are like our own Milky Way galaxy, but much further away, obviously. I think this one's about 83 million light years away. <coughs> this is Centaurus A. This is near the Southern Cross. And near Omega Centauri, and just for fun, I'm just put the drawing of what it looks like for a telescope. On the left there, um, and it's a lot more interesting, you've got all these violent twists <clears throat> in that dust band that cuts through this thing. You see a lot more stars as well. I'll get lots of messages. So I'm just kidding. No, it's all good. And this is a chain of galaxies, uh, Markarian's chain this is in Virgo. Um, I did that with a small telescope. First time, I never, I'd never imaged that before. I just set it up and just went for it. But that was done from a dark sky site. Uh, the previous one that was done from my backyard on the 10th of June, just for, for fun. As was this one that was done, I think, on the same night. Uh, spiral galaxy and another one here. And yeah. Okay, supernovae. Now, I only found this out today. But um, those of you that are paying attention will notice something here in a moment. Um, so I talked about this object earlier. This is the Crab Nebula. It's a supernova explosion that occurred in our galaxy about a thousand years ago. It was detected, observed, continued to expand out. What it looks like through a telescope is pretty ordinary, um, but you can see quite a bit of detail with special filters. Um, <clears throat> so this was one of the few supernovae in the last thousand years. Uh, that has been detected in our, our galaxy. We're actually overdue that. Average, the, the thought is that they occur every 100 years on average. We're 400 years overdue, right? <laughs> one is hoping one would go off sometime soon so we can at least observe it locally. Uh, there was one in the large Magellanic cloud back in 1987. Um, that's, that's it. That's a bit too far. We want something a bit closer. All right, so a few days ago, a few a couple of weeks ago, actually, we were at a winery. Uh, for a star night. And there was a new supernova had been discovered a few days earlier. Oh, about 50 or so supernovae are discovered every day in other galaxies, not ours. We're still waiting out to. But there are remote robotic telescopes, much bigger than what we have here, searching the sky and satellites searching the sky for things that change. Some of that work is uh, uh, centered around detect early detection of as incoming asteroids or things that may do us harm. <laughs> But they're picking up changes in the night sky and supernovae are uh, one thing that they're picking up in galaxies. So this was discovered uh, a few days before I took this image. And it just so happens to be in a galaxy that's about 60 million light years away. And that galaxy, it's that elongated shape, is interacting with another galaxy and actually known as the butterfly galaxy. <laughs> I kid you not. Right? I, never, I wasn't aware of that term. They, they had another name that's politically completely incorrect now. And um, that's what's going on there. Uh, there's a supernova indicated by those little lines, right? In fact, here's another one. Uh, this is another galaxy. Uh, and I, these next set of images I did, I took in one night while sitting in my car in the middle of a paddock where it was absolutely freezing and my telescope was outside and I just had the iPad and I was going, go, go, go. And so all these next set of images of supernovae were taken that night. That was on the 13th of May, one of the few clear nights we've had in the last few months. All right, so there's one there. This is in a galaxy 85 million light years away. You can see some other little fuzzy things around it. That's their other galaxies. So this little spiral galaxy, that bright star in the middle there is just was just like all the other fuzzy stuff in that galaxy, except it went supernova. It went, just completely exploded. And um, that, that one there went off on the 20th of April. Oh, there's a date there. So what I do is I capture these images, I take a few images and I 
I run a cursor over it. I run some special software that tells me basically quickly determine how bright it is. And that's useful data, which I then submit to the supernova folk. All right, here's another one. Uh, in case you missed it, that's it there. Can you see the supernova? No, a few galaxies. So we'll just zoom in on that. So there you can see that spiral structure there. And there's that supernova in this galaxy, which is a bit further out. This is 190 million light years away. Um, uh, around the time of the dinosaurs is when that light left <laughs> to reach us. And again, same idea. Okay, there's another one there, a little fuzzy object in the middle there is a galaxy. This was very low in the sky. I'm amazed I even got this image. A couple of other spiral galaxies nearby. Zooming in on that, yeah, there it is there. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a bit further away. That's 240 million light years away. Um, around the time that dinosaurs started to roam the earth is when that light left us. Dinosaurs were around for a very long time. <laughs> and um, here's another one just to finish it off. These are all done in the same night, in the same vehicle. Um, this is 390 million light years away. So again, the light left us before even dinosaurs roamed the, the earth. So how did you command what search? How do I command what, sorry? The search for the supernova. Ah, okay. So there are numerous remote telescopes around the world and they're constantly observing the sky and their discoveries are published on the internet. So I go and look at that site every other day and I see how many have appeared and how many are within the reach of my gear. And so they're often associated with, our, associated with the galaxy. So I just type in PGC 42840, and that's how it goes. The telescope goes there. Yeah. So that's the idea. And here's another one. I'll just put, I'll put this one up for a reason. Um, uh, again, very, very faint. Magnitude 17.9. I mean, you can't, even that brightest one I put up there, you can't see that through a telescope. Right? You just cannot. So you need this sort of technology. To bring it out. Uh, but that was taken from a dark sky site. And this is the same galaxy taken a few days earlier, if I get it right. This is taken from the backyard, and I'm sure I didn't process it correctly in terms of one of my settings was out as it was coming in. But again, I'm seeing that supernova from my backyard. Right? This is exceptionally, exceptionally faint. Actually, the biggest problem I have in my backyard are trees, <laughs> more so than light pollution. <laughs> And so I'm shooting between trees, and I think this one ran into the tree while I was taking the shot. Uh, but anyhow. All right, so a couple of other photos just to finish up. Near and very, very far away. What have we got here? Ah, so that little line in the middle there is actually the asteroid uh, Didymos. And this is the asteroid that was impacted by that NASA mission in September last year. That sent a, a DART mission to actually impact the asteroid not so much that asteroid, but there is a there is a little asteroid that orbits it. It impacted that one deliberately to try to deflect, demonstrate deflection of asteroids that may be incoming. So I photographed this um, on the Saturday night, and the impact was Tuesday morning. We had clouds all that time after after Saturday, so I didn't get any more. But the thing is, you can sit there with someone, uh, show this to people live as we were doing on the night. And that little streak mark is its motion every minute, every so yeah, every minute. So as the pro, as the photo progresses, you just you see a slight jump every minute, then it jumps and jumps and jumps right as it's moving through the sky. Not very exciting, but um, it's it's showing, it's demonstrating that things are moving right in the night sky. Uh, that line on the on the right, by the way, is a is an aircraft light, aircraft set of aircraft lights. It's not a satellite, so they get in the way as well. Oh, this object here, I don't know if I've got much more on that. No, I don't. Um, this, this object is a comet that was discovered um, in the first, I think it's the first week of this year, 2023. It's called uh, 2023 A3 Chushin Shan Atlas, after the discoverers, the two observatory. Uh, that comet is, gonna, is predicted to become very, very bright. We've heard that before, haven't we? in October and uh, September and October next year, 24. 
it's going to get remarkably close to the sun and then get quite close to the earth soon after that. It's going to be well placed in our skies for observation. So that's an early shot of it, taken a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, it's moving as well. The sun, you can take images with the right filters and it's exceptionally dangerous. I wouldn't do it, but you can take photos of the sun and the sunspots. It's done. Ah, and that's Proxima Centauri. That's our closest star to our sun. Okay, we've probably all heard of Alpha Centauri. You can see two stars when you look, really bright stars. You can see one star when you look up in this nice sky where Alpha Centauri is. Look through a telescope, you see two stars that are in orbit. There's a third member, and that's Proxima Centauri, which is a faint red dwarf, about two degrees away in the sky. And um, that's our closest star to our sun. 4.25 light years. It's a red um, dwarf star. Most of the stars in um, our Milky Way, by long shot, are red dwarfs. We don't, we can't see a lot of them because they're so faint. We can only see this one because it's so so close to us. It does have at least two planets orbiting it. It's also uh, a flare star. It puts out a lot of intense radiation. So the initial thinking was those planets are toast in terms of any life on them. But it's been determined about a year ago that most of that radiation is actually goes out through the poles. So as a flare star, so it just shoots out all this radiation every few hours. Uh, but that's where it is. And if you try looking for it in a telescope visually, good luck. Uh, it, you can see it, but you struggle to find it. And uh, I think this is my last slide. Um, this is a quasar. Now, a quasar is um, essentially a super, ultra super massive black hole, believed to be, that in this case is devouring an entire, not just a few stars, but an entire galaxy. <laughs> All right, it's and that's why it makes us well, that's why it's so bright for its distance, which is determined through redshift. So, using redshift and the color of the, the light that comes from that, that dot that's marked there, you can determine its redshift at 3.26 units, which equates to 12.7 billion light years. So, that light left well before our sun even formed, let alone our planets or life on Earth. That's how it's been traveling for that long. We can only see it because it's been gravitationally lensed by a galaxy that's in the foreground that's bending the light, enabling us to see it. It's really hard to make out that galaxy. You won't do it on this, you won't. You, maybe they'll turn Hubble or the James Webb Space Telescope onto it. Um, but that's what's going on there. It's, um, it's very, very far away. And uh, it's basically a black hole devouring the entire galaxy, creating all that radiation at that distance. And I think that's where I end. Um, in conclusion, then, um, these real-time techniques, uh, technologies are really enabling uh, more compelling views of the universe beyond the conventional Mark I eyeball and a visual telescope. It's also enabling a lot more people to get excited and participate in, in, in astronomy, and including from light polluted locations, whether they're doing it just for pure enjoyment, whether they're supporting outreach events, um, whether they're contributing to citizen science or participating in some sort of discoveries program. And these smart robotic telescopes are really simplifying that access. So an amateur astronomy has an exciting future. So that's where I finish and I'll take questions with a butterfly nebula in the background, <laughs> which is by the way is in Scorpius. So, Carol, um, Kiva, are there um, public viewing nights similar to the one that you showed in Arizona or Nevada? Um, uh, are any other visits, or do they happen from time to time where you can actually, you know, actually see this and get excited? About not, it? not on that scale yet. Um, we usually have one or two telescopes equipped with uh, imaging devices, so I usually take along a, a TV monitor. My computer monitor and my iPad, which is controlling the telescope, grabbing all the images. <clears throat> Those images are then beamed automatically uh, to the TV monitor. So you can see the stuff up. So there's usually two telescopes doing that. The rest are visual at the moment. So there's anything planned to down the track to 
Know it? So you need to look at our website, the ASA website, asa.org.au, and you'll see where the upcoming viewing nights are okay. planned. We had a big problem in, during COVID. We shut everything down, uh, as most people did. And we started up again uh, using electronic observing. People, at that time, we weren't allowing people to touch telescopes, put their eyeballs on our <laughs> telescopes, share eyepieces, share binoculars, etc. We just cut that out. We can do is it really a combination of things these days, visual and electronic. <clears throat> so look at the website for dates. Questions, anyone? Okay. All right, well, that's it from me. And um, thank you uh, for your patience. Okay. Um, I found it fascinating, absolutely, particularly the advances um, mm. using machines like this and the cameras. So it's just amazing because I've looked through my you know, telescopes before and gone, oh, yeah, fine. <laughs> that was my question to the audience, by the way. Let's look through what he said. Years ago. <laughs> but uh, I just think that um, the advances are just, just incredible and they're so exciting. Mm. Uh, I mean, my experience that I've done a lot of work in the desert and uh, I think to, to 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 lay on your on your on your swag and just look up in the night sky from you know one horizon to the other you know sort of up several hundred kilometres sort of north of Cougar Pedy, it's just the most awe inspiring and amazing sight you mm. can ever see. Yeah. And uh, I've done that many many times <coughs> and just looked up and thought, wow, that is amazing. Um, and it's it, and and this is a, is an opportunity to to, to bring this to life. To people, and mm. uh, I think it's a very exciting future. And I'd mm. like to suggest that you know, if you we know of one of these events happening, that to come along and, and, and just take part because it, to me it's just the future. Um, to, to raise awareness and, and, and excitement, not just people my age, but young people as well. Yep. So, so well done. I think mm. what, what you put up there is, is, is brilliant. As for the butterfly. <laughs> 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 so on that note, we'd like to give you our book, Take oh, Butterflies fantastic. to Your Garden, What's Thank Your you. Own Concern in the Adelaide Region. And um, I hope that you enjoy it again. Thank oh, you thank so you much, very much for your talk. Oh, thank you. And, it's a pleasure. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone to, to thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>